And joining us now here in studio, Michael Higgins, Vice President for Mission and Catholic Identity at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. Ian Benson, Senior Associate Counsel with the law firm Miller Thompson and a professor of law at the University of the Free State in South Africa. And Michael Corrin, author of the book, Why Catholics Are Right, and his newest is called Heresy, 10 Lies They Spread About Christianity. As I welcome the three of you back here to our studio, I want to remind everybody we've got our live chat going on. Go to our website, theagenda.tvo.org. Chime in and share your views on the subject at hand. It is not often that something happens at Queen's Park and they talk about it all over the world. But we've got that situation here right now. And to that end, here's John Allen Jr., who writes in the National Catholic Reporter. In Ontario, there's long been an undercurrent of grumbling in some quarters about the religious identity of Catholic schools. A few cynics joke there's no need to dismantle the Catholic system. Just stand back, they say, and watch it collapse from within. Last week, an Ottawa priest named Father Anthony Hannon urged about 900 Catholic youths at a March for Life conference, quote, it's up to you to transform the system from the inside. If we want to save the system, if we want to save the Catholic schools, we must make them Catholic, Hannon said, insisting that it's a real injustice that students who take the faith seriously feel ostracized in Catholic schools. Hannon urged the youth to get a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and bring it to class to ensure that the authentic teachings of the Church are presented in their classrooms. Okay, let's start here. Michael Corrin, you first. How Catholic is the Catholic school system in Ontario? Not very. Uh, they claim 47,000 teachers. I don't know the numbers, but my experience of putting four kids through the system and speaking at numerous schools and having lived here for 25 years is that um, a rough estimate, maybe 10% 10, 10 of teachers are serious Catholics. And by serious, I mean actually make an attempt to, to attend Mass every Sunday, observe the sacraments, uh, try to live as Catholics. They may fail, but they say that they, they aspire to. Uh, you just... Yesterday, I met with someone, he was a former parliamentary candidate for a certain party in, uh, in Toronto, um, whose sister was told by someone supervising her when she was training to be a teacher, and uh, forgive the, at least the, the euphemism here, um, if you quote the effing Pope again, I'll fail you. Uh, Wait a minute, who said that to whom? This was someone supervising and training teachers for the Catholic system. I understand, Steve, for many non-Catholics, they're incredulous at this. It's a Catholic system, but the reality is the vast majority of teachers are not seriously Catholic. And the teachers' union is quite vehemently now anti-Catholic. So Catholic maybe in name only, but not much more? Is that what I hear you saying? Portuguese, Italian, uh, Polish, Irish, um, uh, whatever. Well, actually, Filipino tend to be a little bit different. They may be good people. They may be good teachers, certainly, but they're not good Catholics. So we have to conclude at a certain point, do we retain the name Catholic, or do we just say they're part of the greater public system? Michael Higgins, same question. How Catholic is the Catholic school system in Ontario? It's very Catholic. I disagree completely with Mr. Corrin for a number of reasons. I was a trustee of the school board, president of two Canadian Catholic universities, worked with faculties of education, helped to draft the philosophy of Christian education statement for OECTA, and have been involved OECTA in is it's the, the Ontario Union. English Catholic mm -hmm. Teachers Association, and have worked for a long time with various trustees across the country, given keynotes at their national conventions. I think Michael's point about um, the fact that there is probably a fair bit of tepidity, a fair bit of range in terms of commitment within the system is true. But I think it's rather apocalyptic to assume that uh, these 45,000 plus uh, teachers are um, merely a shade Catholic rather than substantively Catholic. They represent, they represent naturally, uh, because of our microcosm, of the larger spectrum of debate and issues that roil the church. Uh, but I wouldn't ever conclude, uh, judging from the many occasions in which I've given uh, professional development days, that they are anything other than committed to Catholic education. It is a caricature of Catholic education out of several, Michael's not the only one, of course, there are several who are dissatisfied with it, who think that its primary job is catechetical, it fails in that. It's not really a vehicle for the church. As a consequence, it's become perhaps a center of dissent. I think that that's a shibboleth. I have a legal question for you, but do you want to break the tie here first? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd probably not. By the way, I have to say, I'm not at all surprised, by the way, that you were asked and delivered many lectures and were so involved. But with all due respect, that's part of the problem. And you were at St. Jerome's, and I knew it well, which is why I would be asked so often by Catholic kids to come in and try and help them, because they felt so, so isolated and, and jettisoned and rejected. And there are many Catholics watching right now, honestly, my friend, who are just saying, are you serious? I mean, what you're saying is such a caricature. You, I'm, I'm, 
okay, you may leave it. Right, no, let, yes, let me yes. let him in, and then I got to get Diaz. Yeah. Go ahead. You, you can have a retort if you want to that. Uh, well, I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, uh, you've had the occasion to come to the University of Waterloo. Uh, Saint Jerome's University is a university with a vibrant Catholic identity. Uh, there are universities in the country, Catholic universities, that do not have them, and they, I think uh, it's a serious point. But I'm, I'm uh, not at all sure what charge or allegation do you have working in your Machiavellian mind, Michael. Well, but not Machiavellian. Uh, okay. I'm oh, really most Catholic. clearly oh, not Machiavellian. Ian's turn, really Ian's turn here. Naturally. The general public is paying for education in this province for about 95% of the students in this province. They're either educated at the publicly funded public school system, the publicly funded Catholic school system, the French system, etc. If they are... Do their elected representatives therefore then get to say what goes on in those schools? Uh, it depends on what area. Um, the this, the this, this area of subjects that are covered, the kind of questions relevant to school boards is so wide. You have to make a distinction between those matters that are properly denominational and those matters that aren't. So in answer to your question, it would depend on whether what's at issue is something close to the core of denominationalism, in which case it would be legally protected as a denominational area, or not, in which case it wouldn't be. Well, we've got a real-life example in front of us right now, this mm. whole issue of gay-straight alliances. Does the government of Ontario have the legal right, in your view, to tell the Catholic school system, if the kids want to call them this, you have to let them call them this? Depends what is meant by the title. Uh, some are saying it's just a name, what's in a name. Um, and there's a difference about that, I think. There are those on probably on both sides, not all of them talking openly at the moment about what's in a name as they understand it. And I think it's fair to say that uh, as, as time progresses and it becomes clear what's actually implied or meant or intended by these, these clubs, we'll see then whether there's a principal conflict between one, one viewpoint and another, and that's, at the, that's the point at which the, the legal question is really raised. Did you, when you were a trustee, Michael Higgins, get calls from constituents saying, this system isn't nearly Catholic enough. There's stuff going on we don't like. I did, but their number was infinitesimal. And it would often be over a matter of some dispute, perhaps with a religion teacher, or anxiety that um, the catechetical instruction that they had been familiar with when they were growing up was now being mediated by somebody whom they either distrusted or they were fearful of the infection in the system of some kind of nefarious progressivism. But more often than not, uh, the vast majority of people that I had to deal with as trustee, their concerns were legitimate. They would be around moral concerns. They would be around sexuality and relationality. There would be concerns about practice, church practice, which is not insignificant, and, it, and it's difficult to gauge, or to use certainly as a, as a monitor of, of fidelity, as, as the monitor of fidelity. They would be concerned, I think, about a number of different things. So it would vary greatly. These issues would be brought, Steve, uh, to board meetings. And board meetings would also have representatives right across the spectrum. Steve Woodworth, uh, who was part of our community for a long time, is now a member of the government. And uh, Steve ran as a trustee. Steve would often appear in the, in the gallery. People were invited to ask questions, very pointed questions, and very often in a robust manner. So it wasn't a matter of uh, boards or trustees, in my experience, running roughshod or actually neglecting, or worse of all, uh, dismissing these concerns. It's a matter of engaging them with where they are. Okay, conversely to you, <coughs> you I think you've described yourself as a serious Catholic. Is mm. that, that's a, an okay answer. I think it's a helpful term. Okay, yeah. hang on. Here's the question then. Is it possible when you've got a separate school system here that has to appeal to many different kinds of Catholics, mm. parents, teachers, students, administrators within it, can it be just a system for serious Catholics, or does it have to be broader than that? It's a very good question. I, I think if we asked, for example, a, uh, a Jewish school principal, if they would have a lot of Christian kids there or Muslim kids, could it still work as a Jewish school? He might say it would be rather difficult. Uh, Is that a good analogy? I think I'm not it's, talking I think about non-Catholics in this system. Well, I think that's system. what you do have in the system. Um, being born of a particular ethnicity or being baptized doesn't guarantee you're a Catholic. You have to at least spar to a belief system. I'm not saying that everybody goes to their, their daily life uh, being aggressive about their faith and believing and always turning the other cheek, but you have to aspire to something. Now, what you have now in the Catholic system is a whole generation of teachers who, who won't form themselves as Catholic. 
I mean, the, the, the stories are legion. The, the official reports are legion. You have to look at some of the resolutions of the uh, OEC to the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association and, and what they're saying, and uh, speak to individual teachers who are seriously Catholic, how they feel, if they feel encouraged, if they feel isolated, if they feel marginalized and abused. And we look at the number, we look at the number of kids who leave Catholic school and actually attend mass, and <laughs> not very many, and that says a great deal as well. Um, I'm not going to blame the trustees and the school boards here very much. Look, you know trustees better than most people. Some of them are merely ambitious to go on to, to further their careers in politics. That's fair enough. It's a stepping stone. There are some who are serious Catholic, but I would say the minority, certainly in Toronto. When it comes to the bill you're talking about here, which is a catalyst for the, 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 the discussion, it's, like, it's not about the name, Steve. The name is, is largely irrelevant. Semantics can always, can always be conquered. This has a, an origin, 1981, Gay Street Alliances. They, they have a specific purpose, and it's not to fight bullying, it's to affirm, to affirm young people in their sexuality. Now, that is acceptable in a public school, but not when it's contrary to the teaching of the school, and in a Catholic school, it's contrary to Catholicism. So, Ian, help us with this. We have, as, as has been pointed out, the Teachers Association, the Catholic Teachers Association, which is okay with the government's plans. We also have the trustees, and of course the Catholic Church, who are not okay with the government's plans. How do we resolve? I mean, what are we to make of all this? Well, there's a nuance there. It, it's not that they are or aren't okay with the government's plans. Everybody's united that they're opposed to bullying. The question is, is that what this is really about? Mm -hmm. and, I, and my point earlier is that time will tell, literally, in this one. Well, do you doubt the government's position on this? Uh, I think there's... Uh, no, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what it is. There's some, there was some language in the bill that I thought was, certainly if one was to paint a spectrum of, of involvement in the rhetoric of sexual identity politics, there's some material in that legislation that would be very unusual. Mm -hmm. The terms homophobia, for example, used in legislation are by any stretch unusual, much less the long list of, of uh, groups that were being encouraged, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, intersexual, queer and questioning is the actual language. Well, that's pretty unusual in legislation and I think paints the, 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 uh, a different context um, than this just being about bullying. Well, okay, let me just do one follow-up here. I guess mm. the two main positions on this are either this is about bullying or it's about the state trying to legitimize um, an orientation among some of its citizens that other of its citizens don't like. And do you think the government of Ontario is really in the business of trying to legitimize through the force of law? Is that what this is about? Yeah. Being gay? It's not about the, the, anyone attempting to legitimize the orientation. It's what, is the, what can be taught about sexual orientation. That's really the difference. There's one group of citizens, I think it's fair to say, who, who say that having the orientation creates the right to practice the orientation. Another group of citizens who say, no, there's nuances to that that have to be understood, that are difficult to understood, and that are part of our belief system. What you really have here, very clearly, is a conflict of beliefs about sexual conduct matters. And that's something that we have to step back as a, as a culture, not just in Ontario, but in, and not just in Canada. But in many of these countries, we have to ask the question, to what extent within plural societies, pluralistic societies like Canada, can we tolerate the coexistence of different belief systems relating to sexual matters? And I think, actually, um, as a pluralist myself, somebody who believes very strongly in diversity, we should be encouraging as many different viewpoints as we can on matters within certain limits. The problem is, some people say, well, the limits here um, surely should not allow what they uh, would liken to racism. They'll say the Catholic position is akin to racism. Mm -hmm. Catholics, of course, don't believe that. They believe their viewpoint is a respectful one, just differing on what's acceptable conduct. Let me do one more thing with you, Michael Higgins. Do you think the, the Catholic teachers, by essentially being on side with this, their association anyway, uh, do you think they're kind of letting down the side here in some respects? Well, that's a difficult question to, to ask. It's more political than theological, <laughs> hmm. and to the theological, but the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association is a union. Okay, and unions do what unions do. Yeah. And uh, one has to frame it within that. Uh, the uh, Owecta's opposition to Cardinal, Carter's, Car Cardinal, Car Cardinal Collins' statement and their support for the uh, Premier of the province is, I suspect, a very careful amalgam of political decision-making, discernment about what is the right way to move, plus, very, I, I would hope, 
a, a genuine concern that what they're supporting is in fact going to be uh, an enlightened environment, controverted admittedly, but enlightened. But what I, what I, what I want to, to situate, Stephen, that might be helpful in the discussion, both the legal and the otherwise, is, is to look at this in the, con in the larger historical and global context. What is happening in Ontario? You started off by quoting uh, John Allen. So Kansas City is interested. But it isn't just Kansas City. There are all kinds of places that are interested because what I think is happening in the Catholic Church, and it is a genuine challenge, and it's going to bring, I hope, a number of Catholics to the table to uh, seriously, and I think there are a number of us are serious Catholics, to use Michael's phrase, to, to look at ways to try and find a modus vivendi, to try to find a way to say how do we live, uh, exist even as a church, not just the church over against society, but, and the church in society, but the church itself. Let me be brief, which I'm hardly ever. But <laughs> I think a lot of what we have now actually began in 1968. When Pope Paul VI issued his uh, controverted encyclical, Humanae Vitae, he made it very clear that the philosophical and biblical anthropology that is at the core of the Catholic Church's understanding of the natural law and the uh, teleology, who we are, what we're destined to, the functionality of our biology, our sacramentality, that was clear. Mm. Now there's all kinds of controversies around that could take us in different directions, but no one can contest that. That document and that teaching was itself hugely controversial. There were issues around reception, there was nuancing the debates, there were censures, all kinds of things. It seems to me that what we're having now is a return to some of that argument, <coughs> not by which I mean a radical reinforcement of the sanctions or an effort to raise it to the status of an infallibility document, but rather both popes, John Paul II, but especially Benedict, have concluded that the issues around the body, the issues around how we live out our physicality, who we are, what is, what is the nature of our relationality, what is the nature of our anthropology, and how it's grounded in both uh, the, the Bible and in natural law is now under serious threat from all kinds of quarters. Mm -hmm. So the abortion certainly is one of them and has been the major flag bearer for a lot of the controversies in the culture of abortion in the United States. But the most recent iteration is around, of course, same-sex marriage okay. and uh, homosexual relations. All of it depends very greatly on the church's emphasis to try to recover and to try to bring back into general acknowledgement the validity of a teaching it sees, uh, certainly at the current moment, that it cannot change. Okay. And so that's where it comes to this issue. We're talking about how do we find a way of working together within society where there is considerable plurality both within and outside the church. That, that was wonderfully intellectual, and now I want to bring it right down into the gutter and do what Woodburn and Birdseed said. I heard Donald McGinty say the identical <clears throat> thing just the no, other day. No, you did not. No. <laughs> I want to do what Woodward and Bernstein said, and that is follow the money. Uh, Michael Corrin, let's talk about this. Mm. For 26 years, I think, in the province of Ontario, we have, as taxpayers, fully publicly funded the Catholic school system. I heard John Tory on the radio the other day, yeah. the former PC party leader and a guy who knows something about the toxic mix of religion and education and politics from that 2007 election, say that if the Catholic school system doesn't want to follow what the policy of the government of the day is, then don't take the money. Mm. Oh, it's from John, wasn't it? Really? Is that, well, jo I think John's position has always been, we got to be fair. I think it's changed radically, but you know, John's a mutual friend of ours, but <laughs> he lost an election over that single issue when people reacted very much to the idea of funding Muslim schools. That was the practicality of, of the opposition, and now he's changed his mind on that, but he has a perfect right to. This is a bit I, of... I don't know, I, I'm, just, I'm not going to sit here and defend him because that's well, not my job. I don't know that he's changed his mind. I think he says he tried to come up with an idea mm -hmm. that he thought would be fair to all religions in society. He didn't think it was fair that only Catholics get publicly funded It's not about John, and we both 20... have great respect for him. But I, I think it, it's, and this is really not about John Torrey because I like him very much, but it's rather banal to suggest that because the Catholic Church says we have to be rather Catholic in our teaching, you should take money away from the Catholic Church. Now, practically speaking, there's not that much money involved. These kids still have to be taught. The schools will exist. If you take away, if you sponge the word Catholic, you're probably going to save $10, $15 million, something like that. But you still have to pay all the teachers. You'll lose some union jobs and a few bureaucrats, oh, but it's not going to be a major saving. Seven billion dollar system. A separate school system they don't gets seven billion dollars. But, but Steve, they don't disappear. I mean, I'm not even well, here. You've to got to teach them. Yeah, of I mean, they, they they continue. The teachers continue. The kids continue. Oecta and Michael was absolutely right. They're a union. I mean, they may say association, but they are a union. They are rightly defensive of Catholic teaching, not because it's Catholic, but because it's teaching. They don't want to lose any jobs here. But I would say the majority of people in Ontario 
question, if not completely uh, doubt, uh, uh, two forms of, of education. There are many, I'll use the word again, serious Catholics who are beginning to doubt the future of Catholic education. They will send their children to the public system because they, they'd rather have no religion taught than what they see as a perverse form of, of their religion taught. But I don't think the money saved would be enormous. I'm not saying that to defend the system. I'm just trying to be honest and practical here. It's, and not, I'm not, it's not about money. It's, well, uh, no, at the, at, no, at the end of the day, the, what this is really about is the nature of your, your plural society. It's important to fund alternative frameworks. But the, one of the reasons for funding them is that everybody's in the public, not just atheists and agnostics. Um, people who pay taxes, Catholics who want to have their children educated, are just as much in the public as non-Catholics. But this issue has raised the question in broader society of, if Catholics don't want to, and I shouldn't say Catholics, if, if, the, if Catholics in church hierarchy mm -hmm. think it's a problem to follow the policy of the government of the day, which has been legitimately elected, if you don't like the policy, get rid of the government, but they're in, they get to decide. If you don't like their policy, don't take their money. That's the, that's the issue that's well, come back again. That's a frequent, well, that's a frequent <laughs> argument, but it misunderstands the nature of the public. Public religion is within the public as much as non-religion. This is a common problem, of, of, which I think it drifts up from south of the 49th parallel with their strict separation approach. Canada does not have a separation of church and state in that way. What Canada has, and it's important to understand this, is really a cooperation of church and state. Different configuration and very important. It means that with respect to things like education and health care, we are willing to allow religious projects, and I'm very glad we do, um, publicly funded. And the reason for that is that they, they convey a different form of, of their health care or their education in ways that play positively in a plural and diverse society like Canada. But does, does it make sense in the 21st century in the province of Ontario to fund one religious, one religious set of schools to the exclusion of all others? No. We should so fund what, all of them. That's what Tory, well that was Tory's solution well, in 2007. See, I think it's a mistake to view a late in an election campaign mistake uh, politically as having definitively determined the question. I don't believe for, the, for a moment we've had a proper principle debate about what the benefits and detriments would be of extending religious mm. funding. Consider this, one of the, the, the reasonable things that a state can demand of educators receiving money might well be, and I think it should be, a certain core curriculum on civics. We have yet to really have a discussion about what a robust and, and uh, necessary and sufficient civics program um, would be in, in education, public or religious. And I think we desperately need that, but we're not going to get to it as long as we keep approaching it with this kind of full drift ahead uh, approach that we currently have in Canada. I want to do just a little more on the money, because I think, and we're going back 25 years now, so I may have this wrong. My recollection is St. Michael's College School didn't take the money that when correct. it was I off there. I taught you there. You taught there. Okay, because they, they were afraid of the strings that came attached. Should, they were. Should that be a broader policy within the Catholic family of schools now? There are private Catholic schools. St. Michael's was a premier one, of course, but there were others as well, uh, De La Salle and uh, a few others that have cropped yeah, up in recent years. They took the money and then gave it back. They gave it back. Yeah. They gave it back. And uh, they gave it back because they didn't want, they didn't want the controls, naturally, that come with the money. Mm. Um, it's interesting, however, that the teachers who were in the system were still members of OECTA. So the, the, the school mm. maintained its private, introduced a tuition, introduced entrance exams, had an entirely different kind of modality, if you like, but also retained some of the features of membership within what was then called the Metropolitan Seven School Board. But you know what is really important to underscore here is a point that you were raising earlier, and that is plurality. I mean, one of the reasons why it's good to have a Catholic school system irrespective of the manner of its funding, its, constitutional, its constitutionality, its historic road dating from the 19th century, and the controversies now with a highly multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-credal dimension in the province of Ontario. Concede all of that. But what we should be looking at is, are, is there empirical data, are there signs, are there examples that would look at the Catholic education system of the province of Ontario and say there's wonderful things that have been brought to fruition, mm -hmm. wonderful ways of shaping character, wonderful voices that have emerged. Not to mention choice. Have, yes, yeah. well, exactly. Just choice. Exactly, mm -hmm. and it, it, I see the biggest problem from my point of view in, in education, whether it's higher education or whether it's at the, at the other level, is the homogenization. Exactly. The homogenization of the curriculum, the homogenization of the teaching uh, oh apparatus. I got, I'm jumping in here because I've got a minute left to go. Okay. And I'm going to give you a real softball just because I like you so go much. Go on then. <laughs> in the U.S. election campaign, 
You remember all the Rick Santorum and the the, uh, con the, the fight about contraception and all that, whether it should be covered? Yes. I think you do remember all of that. We now have this issue here. There are some issues about impinging on religious freedom in the UK as well. I think I know what you're going to say, Michael Korn, but could we infer that Catholics are under attack somewhat around the world today? I think that there are certain cultural norms that are being... Um, pushed and pressurized on people at large. It's not just Catholics. Evangelicals, I think Muslims will face this more and more as they become more anglicized in the Western world, uh, Orthodox Jews too. But yes, yeah, so th there's a, a different assumption of, of how the world works. And Michael mentioned quite eloquently about the, the, the place, the role of the human body, our sexuality in relation to the greater community and the greater world. It's going to get worse. This, this debate over Bill 13, for example, has not been about bullying. You will not find a sane person who will say yes to bullying. It's about sexuality mm -hmm. and, and about uh, That's a certainty which the Catholic Church has and which the secular world has, and they can't come together. And this is going to increasingly will be a, a, a point of, of conflict. We must try and solve it uh, amicably and in a very Canadian way, but it might not be that easy. And you have to do something now you've never done on this program before. <laughs> Summing up in 30 seconds, Michael Higgins. You gave me a minute last year. <laughs> <laughs> Are Catholics' religious liberties under attack around the world today? I think it depends on the jurisdiction and on the region. I think that there's sometimes, uh, coming out of the American jurisdiction right now, and knowing Archbishop Laurie, I think that uh, the uh, religious liberty debates that are going on right now are a, a bit of a heated rhetoric that may actually put the bishops in a difficult position to negotiate uh, post-election. I think they have some legitimate worries. I have no doubt about that. But I think America, in particular, is a, is a very deeply religious society. I don't think Catholics are under attack. For God's sake, six of the nine justices of the Supreme Court are Roman Catholics. This is unprecedented. Well, not all that, practicing. And that's Michael Higgins <laughs> well, from Sacred Heart that. University in Connecticut. Ian Benson from Miller Thompson. We thank you for coming in today as well, Ian. And Michael Corrin. Why Catholics Are Right, that's the previous book, and the one that's out right now, Heresy, Ten Lies They Spread About Christianity, for which there is a one-on-one -on -one between you and me on our website tonight, theagenda.tvo.org. For more on that, check the website. Thank you all. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.